Hi everyone. Good day to you, wherever you are. And I welcome you to the finest music drama channel. Sharing the love, of finest literature. Just, lie down on an easy chair. Throw your cares off your mind. Think of nothing, but the temperature of your drink. I hope, you will enjoy today's dramatization. Your comments are much appreciated. Please support the love, of finest literature, by subscribing and sharing the channel with friends, to get updated on future releases. First, there was a novel by David Dodge, published in 1952, then a classic film by Alfred Hitchcock a few years later, and now, for the first time, a radio adaptation by Gene Buchanan, starring Jeff Harding and Jennifer Lee Jellicorse, is to catch a thief. You once told me that actors were cattle to be shoved about. I wonder if you care to enlarge on that. You mean you want to make them larger cattle than they are? I usually wear a blue suit, a white shirt, black socks. No jewellery of any kind, no ornamentation, not even a response. I think it relates to one's uh, tidiness of mind. I have a very tidy mind. I work very closely with the writer and begin to construct the film on paper. When we roughly sketch in the whole shape of the film, you end up with, say, a hundred pages or maybe even more of narrative which is very bad reading for a literateur. It is as though you were looking at the film on the screen and the sound was turned off. I work very closely with the writer and begin to construct the film on paper. When we roughly sketch in the whole shape of the film, you end up with, say, a hundred pages, or maybe even more, of narrative, which is very bad reading for a literateur. It's as though you were looking at the film on the screen, and the sound was turned off. Robbie! Monsieur Robbie! He was at the front door, and I was out on the balcony over the garden. I knew he'd have the house surrounded. And in the gathering dusk, I could see the shadow of one of them trying to hide by the gate. Monsieur Robbie! Ouvrez! C'est la police! I climbed onto the railing, and then leapt, oh. reaching for a branch of the big olive tree. Ah. I was over the high garden wall effortlessly. Once a trapeze artist, always a trapeze artist. And I was out on the road. I ran. I sat up there in the orchard and watched the four policemen hunting for me outside my garden, their flashlights bobbing around like little bright balloons in the dusk. They soon gave up. I decided it was time to move. I walked the ten kilometers to Villeneuve-Loubet, bought a newspaper, and caught the rattletrap bus along the Route Nationale to Cannes. There was just one passenger, early 20s, evening gown, fur wrap. Why was she riding a bus? She could have bought a car for the price of that wrap. And she was beautiful. I looked at her hands, ears, neck, force of habit. No jewelry, not even a wristwatch. I wondered why. More people got on at every stop. I hid my face in the newspaper until we drew in opposite the big pink stucco casinos in Cannes. I lost sight of the girl after she got off the bus. So I joined the strollers on the Quasette, staying on the beach side where the lights were dim, and only crossing the road to enter the shabby portals of the Hotel Napoleon. Entre. Ah, John. It's you. <laughs> I was wondering what I'd hear from you. Henri Bellini. A friend from my days in the Resistance. 
He spoke seven languages, perfect English, and had numerous business interests. Some legitimate, some not. Have you seen the newspaper? The headlines? Sure. Daring jewel robberies on the Côte d'Azur. Has the cat returned? You bet I've seen it. <laughs> it's not a very good picture of you. I'm not surprised. It was taken in the law courts in 1939, when I was 20. When I was the cat. The past is a foreign country, huh? Not so much a foreign country as a closed book, Henri. I'm leaving France tonight. The police are already after me. <laughs> Just like old times. I grabbed my passport and wallet and got the hell out. I need your help with the passport. Mm hmm? I want you to change the number, name, birth date. Set it back ten years and alter the date on the entry stamp so I can pass as a tourist who got here a few weeks ago. That's not difficult. I'll organize a disguise, then once I'm out of the country, I'm safe. What about extradition? I don't think they'll bother. I'm not that important. Um, one thing, John. If you leave the country, will the burglaries stop? Henri, I give you my word that I am not responsible for these jewel robberies. You know that I used to be a jewel thief. I admit that these burglaries look like my work, but I have nothing to do with them. I'm a respectable expat now. Modest means, quiet life. The highlight of my day is a game of bull. <laughs> so, we're dealing with someone who's modeling himself on you. Yes. <laughs> I suppose it's a, it's a compliment in its way. And one I can do without. So if you tell the police that these are, excuse the expression, copycat crimes, and you're blameless, do you think they'll believe you? Not a chance. And you know as well as I do that if the police go after the cat, they'll find a lot of dirt on the rest of us. True. We need to find this new cat and stop him from operating, get him behind bars. The police are already harassing my associates for information. Would you believe they're arresting some of my Moroccans just for cigarette smuggling? Oh. We need you to help us to nail him, John, before he ruins us. No, I'm not sure there's much I can do. Nonsense. He thinks like you, acts like you, and you know what they say. Set a thief? To catch a thief. Exactly. So, will you help us catch him? Do I have the option of refusing? I'm glad you're prepared to see it our way. Mm. Now, I reckon we start by identifying the likeliest targets for the next burglary. I've already found one. And this potential victim is? Mrs. Stevens, an American widow staying at the Hotel Midi for the season. Jewels insured for $72,000. Is she by herself? No. She's accompanied by her daughter, Francie. Unusual young woman. Beautiful, with beautiful clothes, but never wears jewellery. Doesn't have any. Doesn't want any, not even a watch. Tell me, is she a blue-eyed blonde with a keep-your-distance look? How did you know? I've seen her. From a distance. <laughs> I lay low while Bellini provided me with clothes, padding, hair dye, new passport, new identity. I even shaved back my hairline to look as if I was going bald. I wore shoes with inserts which made me taller with a flat-footed walk. Goodbye, John Roby, 34, lean, fit, ex-cat burglar. Enter a slightly overweight 44-year-old American tourist. Uh, good afternoon. I have a booking. The name is Burns, Jack Burns. Bonjour, monsieur. Welcome to the Hotel Midi. Is this your first visit to Cannes? It's my first visit to France. Uh, tell me, is there a casino near here? The hotel has a casino, sir. You don't say. There's a roulette, sir, and baccarat. And poker? Ah, no, sir. We do not have poker tables on the Riviera. Huh. That evening, Mr. Burns went for his first visit to the casino at the Midi. Mrs. Stevens and her daughter were there, but only Mrs. Stevens was playing. She was a plump woman in her early 50s. Nice looking, apart from the tendency to be haphazard with her lipstick. And she was displaying some of her $72,000 worth of jewelry. Diamonds, mostly. And I wanted a good look at them. Ooh, set. Well, I declare that man's won again. I wonder if luck like that is catching. That, Mother, depends on whether you believe in luck. With my history, dear, I believe in little else. Can we go to bed now? Have you lost enough for one evening? Oh, don't be a wet blanket, Francie. I think our luck's about to change. Before I knew it, she was taking a closer look at me. And I took a closer look at her, but less obtrusively. The diamonds were all real, not copies. And there were a lot of them. 
I just placed small bets. Wow. Mrs. Stevens began to cap my counters with larger bets. She went from 10,000 francs up to the table limit, 100,000. By the time she'd won nearly two million, we were great friends. Well, now, Mr. What'd you say your name was? Burns. Jack Burns, from New York. Well, I'm gonna call you Lucky. Lucky Burns from New York. My daughter and I are from Texas originally. I was wondering if we could persuade your daughter to place a few bets. My life is hazardous enough already, Mr. Burns. Just as you like. Once I'd checked out Mrs. Stevens' jewelry, I had ideas of avoiding her. But it wasn't that easy. The next evening, when I stepped into the hotel's cocktail bar... Lucky! Lucky Burns! There you are! Come and join us! Waiter, get this man a drink. Good evening. And I have something to show you, Lucky. Look, I bought it today in Cartier's with my winnings. It was a small brooch pinned by her neckline. A diamond dog with emerald eyes and a diamond leash ending in an emerald safety clasp. At a snap guess, worth five or six thousand dollars. Isn't it adorable? Very pretty. I hope you have it insured. Apparently there's a jewel thief about. He's right, Mother. You should wait till it's listed on the insurance before you start wearing it. You don't want the cat to get it. Oh, nonsense. There's nothing to worry about. I keep my beads in the hotel safe. And, of course, they're insured. And now I've got a lucky doggy to take care of any nasty cat that comes near me, haven't I? <laughs> How long are you going to be in Can, Lucky? How many more visits to the casino do we have time for? Oh, Mother. A few weeks. I'm not sure exactly. It depends on whether my business can get along without me. And what is your business? Insurance. Well, give me your card. And I'll try and send some customers your way. After all, I owe you something for the dog. Uh, thank you, but no. I'm on my first vacation for ten years. I don't want any business. After that, Mrs. Stevens seemed to appoint herself my best friend. Every time I put a foot in the hotel casino or the cocktail bar or the restaurant... Yoo-hoo! Lucky! It's my Lucky Burns! I wanted to check out other jewelry, newcomers, entrances, exits, without having to be sociable. I took my problem along the Quasette to the Hotel Napoleon. So, Mrs. Stevens is anxious to engage your attention, eh, John? Too anxious. Much too anxious. Though I dare say you wouldn't mind so much if it was her pretty daughter. Henri, she's barely spoken two words to me. Probably thinks I'm another fortune hunter. Besides, I have more to think about than pretty girls. On the contrary. I think that a pretty girl might just be the solution. What? Danielle. Local girl. Very pretty. Charming manners. She works on the beach in that hut where you can book swimming lessons and hire beach chairs. I sometimes find her occasional employment with the tourists. Lady's maid, nanny, and so on. She's the ideal companion for dinner and the casino. That'll stop Mrs. Stevens from bothering you. She has a romantic soul. I'll write a note for Danielle, and there will be a fee for her time. Of course, you can pay that through me. I'll see that she gets it. Less my commission, of course. And John? Yes? This is an arrangement for dinner and the casino only. Understood? Of course. And I need the nights by myself anyway. Watching, waiting. If this doesn't work and the police catch me, I'll be looking at a long time in jail. Think of it as motivation. As I walked back along the Quasette, I played at spotting the plainclothes detectives who were on the lookout for me. They were all wearing dark suits. I watched them sweat. Cannes in midsummer was no place for a man who had to wear clothes. Danielle was on the beach at the little hut which called itself the École de Natation. I gave her the note from Bellini. So you are Mr. Burns. How do you do? I'm so pleased to meet you. She was 19 or 20. Slim, pretty as a flower, with the heart-shaped face so many French girls have, wide at the eyes and tapering to a delicate mouth and chin. Her hair was a short mop of dark curls, and her skin was golden brown from the sun. She was young enough to be Mr. Burns' daughter. We arranged our first dinner date for that evening. Eight o'clock. Shall I come to your hotel? I'll be glad to call for you. No, no, it would be better for me to come to your hotel. Which one is it? The Hotel Meaty. I'll meet you in the lobby. We didn't dine at the hotel. I thought she might feel out of place among the expensively gowned women in the Meaty's huge dining room. 
I took her to smaller, less grand restaurants, and then we'd go to a casino. I always bought counters for both of us. She liked to play, but when she won, she insisted on turning her winnings over to me. She was a delightful companion. Chic, discreet. She didn't take up more of my attention than I wanted, which meant that I could check out the clientele for potential victims of the new cat. And Mrs. Stevens left us alone, apart from an occasional wave. She was usually accompanied by Francie, who ignored me, though I could see her giving Danielle the once-over. I expected her to continue to ignore me, but the next time I went to the beach... Good afternoon, Mr. Burns. Miss Stevens? Francie, please, may I join you? Of course. She was wearing a polka dot bathing suit. Once we'd discussed the hot weather, the only topic we had in common was her mother and her casino habit. Mother wins and loses. She's lost lately, but the money doesn't mean anything to her. It's the thrill. I wish I could get a thrill out of gambling. You don't get much of a thrill out of anything, do you? No. How long are you going to stay here in Cannes? Until the season is over, I suppose. Mother always wants to wait until the last gala so she can make a big splash. Then what? I don't know. New York, or Florida, Switzerland, or somewhere to make another big splash. It depends on Mother. Do you always go where she goes? Usually. She's too friendly to travel by herself. She's always picking up imitation dukes who borrow money from her and forget to pay it back, or try to steal her jewels. I have to look out for her. You sound more like the mother than the daughter. Sometimes I feel that way. She was a strange girl. I felt vaguely sorry for her. Without knowing why. You're not married, are you? I never could seem to find the time. You seem to have the time now. That girl you were with. She's awfully pretty. I've seen you with her several times. You'll probably see me with her several times more. She's delightful company. A dinner in a casino, that's as far as it goes. She isn't half my age. What does life expectancy have to do with it? I was still wondering how Mr. Byrne should respond to this remark when she got up, walked down to the sea, plunged in, and swam away. It struck me that she and Danielle both had a keep-your-distance air about them. And Danielle reminded me of someone I'd known. And I couldn't think who it was. As usual, I took her to dinner that night. Oh, yeah, I did travel. You know, I've traveled in Europe, but I've never been to the United States. Tell me where you learned such good English. <laughs> it's cool. And then I spent a year in England as a lady's maid, but... Um... Well, the job ended, suddenly. Really? Madame walked in just as I was slapping her husband's face for... Um... Inappropriate behavior? Exactly. So that was the end of the job. I came back here. Mr. Bellini finds me temporary work with visitors, or else I help out at the beach. Your work there seems to consist mostly of standing around in a bikini. Why not? I'm not the only girl who does that. It helps bring in customers, you know, who wire chairs and ask for lessons from Claude. Claude was the muscle-bound swimming teacher who glared at me whenever I spoke to Danielle on the beach. And is there a romance going on with Claude? <laughs> Please. Claude wants me to marry him. But he has no brains, he has no money. It's not a winning combination. You're not in love with him? No. But if he had money, or brains, I suppose I could be. We French women are very adaptable. Of course, I'd like to get married one day. Every girl. I looked idly like over the other diners in the restaurant. In the corner, a man in a white dinner jacket, who was dining alone, was looking straight at our table. It was my friend Paul, the Count du Pré de la Tour. I'd spent a lot of time with him in the last few years, after the death of his wife. He was my age. We'd gone climbing, hunting, fishing, anything to take his mind off the laws. I thought he was still away on holiday, but there he was. He seemed to be concentrating on Danielle, but it wouldn't be long before he noticed me. Well, of course, the ideal combination in a husband is money and brains. We'll leave now. Bill, please. What is it, Mr. Burns? I got us out of the restaurant and into the street as fast as I decently could. Have I done something wrong? I'm, I'm sorry. No, nothing. It's not your fault. I looked back over my shoulder. Paul hadn't followed us. I don't understand. What's happening? Danielle, I don't think we'll go to the casino tonight. D'accord. Um, tomorrow night? No, not tomorrow night or the night after that. I think I'm done with casinos. 
I'd just evaded Paul in a dimly lit restaurant. I had no intention of meeting him face to face under the bright lights of the gambling tables. That's something I said. I said something wrong. I, I didn't mean to offend you. Danielle, it's nothing to do with you. I've really enjoyed your company. I, I guess I'm just suddenly tired. Very well. Good night, Mr. Burns. Thanks for everything. Uh, uh, no, w wait a minute. Uh, I owe you your fee for the evening, uh, and let me see you home. No, thank you. And give the fee to Mr. Bellini for me, please. Good night. It was an unpleasant way to end a pleasant relationship. Walking back to the Hotel Midi, I rearranged my thoughts. There was no way I could go into a casino again in case Paul was there. And he was likely to be dining in the best restaurants. That meant that my two main areas of research were inaccessible. But I had established the two most likely targets for the new cat. Mrs. Stevens at the Hotel Midi and Mrs. Sanford, wife of an American property millionaire who lived in one of the most exclusive areas of Cannes. The following day, I went to see Henri Bellini again. <laughs> Bonjour. Uh, Bonjour. Who was that Englishman getting the elevator? How did you know he was English? It was the invisible bowler hat. That, John, was Mr. Page from London. He works for an insurance company. Ah. So why did he come to see you? He wants to get in touch with the cat. And why should he want to do that? The jewelry thefts. There have been some very large claims on Mr. Page's firm, and he's anxious to recover the jewellery as soon as possible. He wishes to contact relevant persons among my associates. Meaning the South of France Mafia. With the aim of putting in an offer for the jewellery before it's broken up. So why did he come to you? I represent the insurance company myself, in a small way. <sighs> Henri, the range of your business interests never ceases to amaze me. I was, of course, eager to assist. I'm sure you were. So what did you tell him? The truth? But I hadn't heard anything about a single stone. Every day that the police make no progress with their inquiries, they become more desperate. And so they increase the pressure on, um, certain of my associates, trying to pop the thief up to the surface like a seed from a grape. But this new cat is cautious and clever, John. Apart from anything else, he seems to have studied your methods in considerable detail. And I can't find out anything about him. I went down to the beach, hired a chair and an umbrella, and sat looking out across the sparkling blue water. On the diving platform, half a dozen swimmers were sunning themselves. I thought how good it would be to plunge into the cool waves. But there was no way I could do that. So instead, I dozed. Mr. Burns? Mr. Burns? Uh, uh. Good afternoon. Uh, Miss Stevens. She was standing next to me in a brief bathing suit, drops of water sparkling on her arms and shoulders and in her eyelashes. Oh, dear. Did I wake you? And you can call me Francie. Where did you spring from? I was on the diving platform. You could see me from there. I have very good eyes. Shall I sit down? I wanted to ask you a question. Well? It's rather personal. I can take it. Are you the cat? I kept my face blank and tried not to swallow. You are the cat, aren't you? <laughs> what? You heard me. What? <sighs> May I call you John? That's your real name, isn't it? I prefer Jack. I prefer John. And call me Francie. I figured it out. You scraped up an acquaintance with Mother. That made me suspicious. People who do that usually want to either borrow money or to steal her jewelry. You haven't tried to borrow money, so you must be after her jewelry. And you're not quite convincing as an American. I am an American. I mean you're not American enough. You never mention your business or baseball or television or hop along Cassidy or politics or wage freezes or high prices or anything current. You need a refresher course. I don't think you've been in America for a long time. How long was it, John? Six weeks. Look at the entry stamps on my passport. Oh, John, anyone can get a passport that says anything. Besides, I was engaged to an insurance man once for all of a week. He never talked about anything but insurance. We're all different. Not in insurance, they're not, John. 
Anyway, I've been in touch with my friends back home, and they've checked out men and insurance in New York. You aren't one of them. I reckon you're in league with that little Danielle. Is she your girlfriend? No. That's why she started work for Lady Carey this morning at the hotel. No. Don't lie to me, John. The Carey jewels are famous. And every thief in Europe knew they were fakes. The originals had gone years ago to boost the family's sagging fortunes. If I were you, I'd leave Lady Carey alone and rob Mother. You would. Even the French police will be smart enough to arrest Danielle if Lady Carey's jewelry disappears. Is she your mistress? Uh, no. Well, it wouldn't be gentlemanly to say yes, would it? I'm sure you're a gentleman. It's one of the things I like about you. Gentleman thief has such a nice sound. Why don't you just take Mother's jewels? They're insured for seventy-two thousand dollars, not counting that diamond and emerald dog brooch that she bought with her winnings at roulette. But I suppose you know how much her jewels are worth. Yes. No. Whichever you prefer. Oh, now you sound beaten down. I'm only trying to help you, John. I don't see why you shouldn't steal Mother's jewels. It would be a fine thing. You'd make a nice profit. She'd have the fun of spending the insurance money, and the French national economy would benefit by seventy-two thousand dollars. How would you suggest I go about it? Well, it would be difficult. Mother leaves her jewel case in the hotel safe all the time, except when she's asleep in the same room with it, and she always bolts her door. Now, are you light on your feet? When I don't stumble over young women with silly ideas. Well, maybe I could leave my door unlocked one night. You could get in that way. Our rooms have a connecting bathroom. Or maybe I could steal the jewels myself and smuggle them to you. How would that be? <gasps> Foolproof. Well, there's just one thing. What? You mustn't take the diamond and emerald dog. It's not insured. Oh, well, that would look rather suspicious, wouldn't it? Leaving one piece behind. Uh, well, I'll think about it some more. I'm going back into the water now. I'd like you to join Mother and me for a drink this evening. In the hotel cocktail bar, eight o'clock. Be there if you know what's good for you. And with that, she turned and ran back into the sea, then dived into the shallows. I watched her swimming away. Then I went to see Bellini. <laughs> so she's got you where she wants you, has she, John? She's convinced that I'm the cat, but she thinks that I operate with a gang, not by myself. So I'll go along with her, play for time. I don't think she'll give me away at the moment. Because? Because she wants to help me steal her mother's jewels. <laughs> Not seriously. Seriously, she's after excitement, a thrill. I'm giving her a thrill. As long as I provide that, as long as she's enjoying herself, I think I'm comparatively safe. But if I try to run, she can have me picked up by the police before I can get out of the country. Hmm. Mr. Page from the London Insurance Company was here earlier today, and he's been talking to the police chief. He wants to offer a reward for information leading to the recovery of the stolen jewelry. The police won't like that. He doesn't care about them. He just wants to get the jewels back as fast as possible. That evening, I stepped into the Hotel Midi's cocktail bar at eight o'clock sharp. Francie and her mother were already there, talking with Mr. Page, who was looking worried at the number of diamonds Mrs. Stevens was wearing in her ears, on her fingers, on her wrists. She was wearing the diamond and emerald dog brooch too, and as usual, her lipstick was lopsided. Hi, Lucky. Here you are. Good evening. Do you know Mr. Page from the London Insurance Company? I don't believe we've met. How do you do? Now, Lucky, come sit by me. Mother, we can't stay. Mr. Burns is taking me to Monte Carlo. I am. I, I am. <laughs> Good. We'll all go to Monte Carlo. No, just Mr. Burns and me. He's as lucky as you say. I want him for myself for a while in the casino. You stay here with Mr. Page. Well, lucky. I don't know what you've done to my daughter. What's come over her? She's proposing to gamble, and she's even wearing my beads. Yes, the beads, unmissable. A magnificent necklace of diamonds and sapphires, and sapphire earrings. The blue of the stones matched and emphasized the blue of her eyes. She was wearing a black strapless evening gown, very plain, in the way that only Dior or Scaparelli could make plain black dresses. Take good care of my child, Lucky, and of my beads, of course. 
They're worth a lot of money, as Mr. Page will tell you. Uh, yeah. I hired a taxi that was waiting at the stand opposite the hotel. It was a huge old heavy Hispano Suiza, open at the back with a glass screen between us and the driver. After Nice, we drove along the middle Corniche. The road, high up on a cliff, followed the curves of the coast, in and out and around, above the sparkling lights on the shoreline. The stars were bright, the night air pleasantly warm. It's lovely. Absolutely lovely. Are you sure? You wouldn't have said that two days ago. Well, things aren't the same when your escort for the evening is a famous jewel thief. So why did you wear that necklace tonight? Do you expect me to steal it? Not right away. I thought you might like to examine it. It's worth $11,000. Shall I take it off? I can't see it in this light. I mean, why are you wearing a necklace now when you never even wear a ring ordinarily? I don't like jewelry. Ordinarily. Why? Just one of those things. Some people don't like parsnips. That's not a reason. Put it this way. Mother owns 17 oil wells. I'll inherit them. I travel with Mother because she's so trusting. Every thief and confidence man sees her coming a mile off. They'd steal her blind if it weren't for me. So I've got so I don't trust anyone. Not even an inoffensive, friendly man like Mr. Burns of New York. So when you're wearing that necklace, you're not just a pretty girl. You're $11,000 worth of diamonds and sapphires. Plus 17 oil wells, yes. That must make it difficult for you to listen to any man who claims to be more interested in the color of your eyes. It does. Especially if he compares them with sapphires. That happened two weeks ago when I was out for the evening. I left him and rode home alone on the bus. Really? And he might just have been paying me a compliment. So why are you wearing that necklace now? Because with you, I don't need to worry about ulterior motives. You're an honest thief. I suppose that's a compliment. If I were a thief, I'd be flattered. <laughs> you can steal Mother's jewelry in a few days' time. Just wait until she's got the dog brooch insured. That was why Mr. Page was there this evening. I'll let you know when he's got it included in the policy. Have you thought how you're going to pull off the theft? Do you think we could just have a pleasant evening without talking business? All right. No business. I hadn't been in Monte Carlo since 1939. Thirteen years in a war had passed it by without changing anything. We went into the casino, which was just as I remembered it. The faded gilt, the ornate crystal chandeliers, the atmosphere of decayed Victorian splendor, all unchanged. Only the American dice tables were new. What are you staring at? Why, the most famous casino in the world, of course. Remember, I'm a tourist. Ah, the gambling place of kings. Fortunes won and lost on the turn of the wheel. Broken hearts, lost hopes, a pistol on the terrace to end it all. I'm impressed. I'm not. Looks like any other casino. Only more moth-eaten. What do we do first? High counters, I suppose. If you really want to gamble. I want to gamble. We left at four in the morning. Francie had won at roulette, lost at baccarat, and experimented without much result at the dice tables. Look at that. Dawn coming up. I still don't understand about gambling. Some people get a thrill out of winning or losing. I know. Mother does. By the way, talking business for a moment, did you notice those emeralds? Emeralds? Mrs. Sanford's the American couple we were talking to. Even an honest man would notice stones like those. Tell me about the Sanfords. They're very rich. They have a lovely home above Cannes, an old chateau. I knew it well. I'd checked it out several times as a potential target for the new cat. They have a gala ball there every year at the end of the season. Mother and I went last year. Lots of famous people. You could have stolen a million dollars worth of jewelry just from the guests, never mind Mrs. Sanford. She's invited us again this year. Shall I get you invited too? I'd like that. It was bright morning when the car drew up in front of the Hotel Midi. As I saw Francie back to her room, I realized that the night had been far more enjoyable than I expected. Good night, John. <laughs> Though I suppose it's good morning. Good night, Francie. 
I went to my room and spent the best part of 20 minutes extricating myself from the clothes and the padding that constituted Mr. Burns. Then I lay down. I wondered why I'd enjoyed talking with Francie so much. Maybe it was because she was American. Maybe I'd been away from America too long. Maybe it was because she was intriguing and beautiful. I threw my clothes back on and did what Mr. Burns would do. Went to see what the noise was about. Ah, oh, Mr. Burns. There you are. I was just telling the manager what time we got back. What? I told you to wait until Mother had insured the dog brooch. What? She's terribly upset. I had nothing to do They're with it. They're already saying it has all the hallmarks of the cat. You had just enough time between saying goodnight to me and now to get in through the window, break open Mother's jewel case, grab everything, and get out. You just couldn't wait, could you? You or your gang. Well, I want that dog back. Not so loud. I'll give you a chance. Return the dog brooch to me by six o'clock this evening, or I'll tell the police all about you. I'll be on the beach between five and six o'clock. I had to agree and play for time. What else could I do? It got worse a few hours later when I was passing through the hotel lobby. Mr. Burns. Excuse me. It was Paul. He must have tracked me down after seeing me with Danielle in the restaurant. But he gave no sign of recognizing me. Mr. Jack Burns. That's right. From New York. Paul Dupre. A friend asked me to call on you. Mr. Dupre. How do you do? We shook hands politely, then went out onto the quasette. I won't comment on the disguise, but your voice gave you away. It's a long story. That night I saw you in the restaurant. You were with a girl. Yes, Danielle. Who is she? Where did she uh, come from? What did she do? Why? I want to meet her. <laughs> You've hunted me out despite the padding and the dyed hair and the half-shaven head and the stupid shoes because you want me to introduce you to a girl? No, no. Uh, I shouldn't have put it that way. The girl, uh, I can't get her out of my mind. The face. Did you notice how much she looks like Lisa? Of course. That was who Danielle reminded me of. Paul's wife, Lisa. Late wife. I'd promised her that I'd look after him. I don't mean Lisa the way she was when you knew her, when she was so ill. I mean Lisa the way she was when I married her, beautiful and glowing. There can't be two Lisas in the world, Paul. I know. I know. But I'd just like to meet this, uh... Danielle. Yeah. What's she to you? A charming local girl I employed in the evenings as a companion for dinner in the casino, for unromantic reasons. Then she went home. I suppose you spent the nights out being the cat. Now, how did you come by that supposition? I've had my suspicions for a while. For instance, you were astonishingly good at rock climbing, yet you claimed to be a novice. And I've been reading up all newspaper reports. Ah, look, John... I have to assume that you've gone back to your whole trade because you need money. And I've got more money than I know what to do with. And I have a huge house. Huh? Just come and live there. It's very good of you, Paul, but there's only one thing you can do for me. Leave me alone. Forget you know me. I want to help you, John. There's nothing you can do. Goodbye, Paul. I walked away without looking at him. It wasn't easy, the deliberate breaking of a friendship. I went to Bellini to ask if he had any information on the dog brooch. No, John. I made inquiries as widely as possible. My Moroccans, our less reputable friends from the Maquis, several petty thieves, my contacts in the Hotel Midi. Nobody knows anything. By half past five, nothing had changed. I went to the beach to find Francie. She was sitting under an umbrella, reading a book. Oh, it's you. May I sit down? If you like. It isn't necessary. My beach bag's open. You can drop it in there. I haven't got it. You've had the whole day. Not long enough. <laughs> if you'll let me explain... I don't want an explanation, Mr. Burns. I want the dog. I sat down next to her and started to talk. I had never told anyone my story before. How I was trained in the family trapeze act in a small-time circus. I was a competent flyer by the time I was 12. My parents died when I was 20. Then I found work as an acrobat. I came to France on an apparently good offer from a French troupe, except... Except what? 
Well, except that it folded by the time I arrived. My passport and money were stolen. I had nothing. I found my way to the Côte d'Azur, did the occasional burglary in the homes of the very rich, climbing up drain pipes and across roofs. Second nature to you. I worked alone. Took only jewelry and loose money. Never used violence. When the summer seasons were over, I went to Paris. Got myself educated. Learned French. Learned how to value stones properly. Read the trade journals. Read the society columns. Very thorough. It was the newspapers who made me the cat. You can read up on me if you really want to. Chapter and verse. For three years, from 1936. But in 1939, I was dealing with the wrong fence. They turned me in. The police caught me. And? Were you tried? Tried and convicted. They gave me 20 years and sent me to a jail near the border with Germany. Then war broke out. When the Germans invaded, they set the prisoners free, thinking that they, well, we would cause chaos. But we didn't. We joined the resistance. I fought with them until the war ended. I am officially a hero of France. I had enough put by for a house and a quiet life. There was an unspoken agreement that the police wouldn't bother me if I didn't bother them. And now you have bothered them? The burglar isn't me, I swear. These new robberies have all the characteristics of my work, I admit. But I am not responsible for them. I give you my word. The word of a thief. A former thief. I've realized that I like being an honest man. Well, honest man, what are you going to do next? Do you remember you offered me an invitation to the gala weekend at the Sanfords? Yes. I reckon the new cat won't be able to resist the jewelry on display there. The following day, the Mistral started to blow in from the southwest. I was walking along the promenade, watching the wind pushing the waves up the beach, when I came across Paul, looking down to where Danielle was moving chairs, cushions, and umbrellas away from the water. So, you're still here? Things to do, you know. Danielle. I still want to meet her. And you need me to introduce you? Yes. I hadn't realized how much she looks like Lisa. But you're right. She does. Come on, then. Danielle, I'd like you to meet a friend of mine, Paul Dupre, Count Dupre de la Tour. How do you do? Monsieur le Comte? Oh, Paul, please. I left him helping her catch a few chairs that were drifting away and went for a long walk by myself. When I got back to the hotel, Danielle was waiting for me in the lobby. She looked extraordinarily chic and slacks in a sweater that suited her just as well as the bikini she'd been wearing on the beach. Mr. Burns, please answer a question. Why did your friend want to meet me? <laughs> Any young man would want to meet you, Danielle. No. I'd like the real reason, please. He stayed for half an hour after you left, and I don't think it is because he appreciates to have his feet in the water to run after chairs. Why is he so interested by me? What did he tell you about himself? Oh, nothing. He asked questions about me. Who I am, where I come from, but it wasn't impertinent and he kept looking at me in a strange way. The bikini? No, it wasn't the bikini. I know that look. It, it was different. I'd just like to know what's going on. Very well. Paul's wife died a few years ago. It broke his heart. He saw you with me in the restaurant, and he was struck by your resemblance to her. He couldn't, uh, can't, get you out of his mind. Mm. Are you telling me that he's likely to want me to be his petite amie? Mm, if you mean mistress, possibly, I couldn't say. He's got money and brains. Good manners, good family. He was emotionally dependent on Lisa, and he needs someone to take her place. And I think he's decided on you. Mm. I see. Thank you, Mr. Burns. After that, I kept a low profile, ate quietly at the hotel, and read the local newspapers, which concentrated on two topics, the cat and the forthcoming gala weekend at the Sanford residence. The more enterprising journalists brought these two subjects together, speculating on the probable value of the jewelry that would be on display. It did not make for comfortable reading. 
I saw Paul once or twice. He mentioned that he'd been invited to the gala. Of course he had. He was a count. He'd asked Danielle to accompany him several times, but she'd refused. I didn't tell Paul that I had been invited to the gala, too. Guests were invited to arrive the day before the ball, so early on the Friday evening, Mrs. Stevens, Francie, and I took a taxi up to the Sanford Chateau. It stood alone on the top of a hill above Cannes, with sweeping views on all sides. The castle had been built and rebuilt over the centuries, and now the Sanfords had spent vast sums to modernize it and turn it into a showpiece. When we arrived, there were guests splashing in the pool and lounging on the terrace, where a light buffet supper was set out. Several plainclothes policemen were trying without success to look unobtrusive. And in the bedrooms, jewelry for the gala ball the following evening was ready and waiting. There for the taking. When I got to my room, I locked the door and spread out the architect's plans for the Sanford's reconstruction, which Bellini had thoughtfully provided. I studied them for some time, reminding myself of the layout of rooms. East wing. West wing. Just a minute. I hid the plans, then went to the door. Paul! I wondered whether you'd be here. I want you to leave, fast. I can't. Make an excuse and go, I swear I'll tell the police. Please, Paul, you have to trust me. Trust you. Stand by and let you hold my friends without lifting a finger to stop you. I haven't come here to rob anyone. I give you my word. Your word? What's that Listen, word, Paul? I'm done listening. Ah! All of his bitterness went into that blow. Oh. I'll be back in quarter of an hour. If you're still here, then I'll hand you over to the police. <clears throat> Mr. Burns was finished. I took off his clothes and the padding and the awful shoes and stowed them in my bag, along with the plans of the chateau. By now, the room was getting dark. I put on a gray sweater, gray trousers, and glove leather shoes with gripping soles. I buttoned money and passport in my hip pocket. It was actually Mr. Burns' passport, therefore worse than useless. But it was a link to something I had hoped to have. got the rooms located for you. I'm next to Mother, and then there's Mrs. Sanford and her emeralds, then the lady with the pearls. John, why is it so dark in here? Can't you turn on a light? John, what's happened to you? You're... I, I just got rid of Mr. Burns. He's in that bag. Suit, padding, shoes. This is the real me. Well, apart from the hair, it'll grow back. John, so you have a full head of hair as well as a... A body? How old are you, really? Thirty-four. Why do you want to know? You'd be surprised. I have to go. I have a thief to catch. If anyone asks, tell them that I... Uh, Mr. Burns had to leave unexpectedly. No time to say goodbye. I slid out through the window and started to climb as the last light faded from the sky. Below me, the terrace and the pool were lit. But I was on the roof, keeping in the shadows, watching, waiting. I knew that the only way into the chateau was through the upper windows from the roof... And the only way onto the roof was to climb up the ivy. Soon the whole chateau was in darkness, and there was only starlight to give a faint sheen to the roof tiles. I saw a movement. I could hear him climbing. Then I saw a shadowy figure walking confidently across the roofs. My main aim was to keep between him and the ivy, and then force him onto the roof of the west wing, where there was nothing but a single roof ridge, ending in a sheer drop. He realized I was after him, so he had to rely on speed and agility to keep ahead of me. He was dressed just as I was, gray against the gray. When he went into the shadows, I had to guess where he'd reappear. I slipped on the tiles, got my footing again, but I'd dislodged one. It slid to the edge of the roof and... Suddenly, I and the man I was chasing were on the same side. Two thieves against authority. The policeman in the courtyard pulled out a gun. He fired into the air, a signal for the rest of them. I caught up with the man I was chasing, then lost my balance, slid. I've got you, John Robbie. Danielle! Mr. Burns? Hey! Oh. oh, we have to move. 
They're grinding on the ivy. This way. Paul's window. We can get in. John! What on earth? Daniel? Monsieur le Comte? Paul, I told you. What are you doing here? Meet the new cat. You two are an egg? No. I've just found out. Is this true? Mm-hmm. Why? You won't care to know. I mean, there's no time for this. Yes, yes, there is. Tell me, Danielle. I was 13 when the war started. I was at ballet school. The school was bombed. My parents' house was bombed. They died. All my family died. Everything I knew was destroyed. The tears were running down her cheeks as she spoke. Her story was uncannily like mine. A bereft child thrown into a harsh world. I managed to get to Switzerland, where I had a distant family. They let me live with them on their farm in the mountains. In the countryside. Far from everything. Soon I began to miss the ballet, the theater. I took my chances with a traveling circus. I trained to be an acrobat, a clown, a trapezist. It was a very small circus. We gave three performances a day. I felt like a monkey on a string. There were things I wanted, security, fun, a nice life. I can give you those. But that was when I got the idea of becoming a thief. I heard about the cat. I read all I could about him and his methods, and then I copied them. That way the police would look for him and not me. I mean, look for you and, and not me. So you're responsible for all these jewel thefts? Yes. I don't care. What did you do with the jewelry? Nothing. It's in the room I rent. It's in a suitcase under the bed. Oh, I don't believe it. Poor you. Paul was stroking her hand gently. I looked out of the window. The house was thoroughly awake, and the sky was already light. What time is it? Nearly five o'clock. The police will start knocking on doors soon, searching rooms, asking questions. I can become Mr. Burns again, but we have to get Danielle out of but... here. I have a plan. Danielle, you and Francie are about the same height and build. Mm -hmm. Behind the sofa! Excuse de vous déranger, Monsieur le Comte. Serait-il possible de fouiller votre chambre? Non, ça n'est pas possible. Y a-t-il quelqu'un d'autre dans votre chambre? Il n'y a personne ici, à pas moi. Je vous donne ma parole d'honneur. Vous le doutez, ma parole d'honneur? Bien sûr que non, Monsieur le Comte. Excusez-moi. Uh. There. I swore I was alone, now I am a liar. The police will be back soon. We haven't got much time. Have you brought your car? Yes. It's going to be back in the garage. So what's this uh, plan of yours? We get Danielle out disguised as Francie. Shall I go and fetch Francie? No, take her a message. All right. I want her to get changed for a dip in the pool. Bathing costume, bathing cap, beach robe. Tell her to go to the pool, make sure she's noticed. Then appear to change her mind. Uh, I don't know why. Too early, water too cold, maybe. Then come back inside and get up here fast. Then, Danielle, you can change clothes and leave. Right. Paul, you take your beach things with you. Once you've given Francie the message, wait until she comes back from the pool, then go to your car. Bring it round to the terrace and leave the engine running. If the police ask where you're going, say that Miss Stevens is feeling anxious after last night's fiasco and you're taking her to the beach for some fresh air. When Danielle joins you, leave as quickly as you can without attracting attention. Go straight to Cannes, to Bellini. I'll give Danielle a note for him. Now get moving. I'll see you in a few minutes, uh, Danielle. Yes, Monsieur Le Comte. Go! I told you. Call me Paul. <laughs> when Francie knocked on the door a quarter of an hour later, I was just finishing my note to Bellini, and Danielle was still hunched on the sofa, hugging her knees. John, I did what you said. I went to the pool, dipped my toe in, shook my head, walked away. There was hardly anyone there, but the policeman saw me. Good. Now give Danielle your beach robe. Put it on over your clothes, Danielle. Okay. And roll up your slacks so they don't show. Thanks. <laughs> 
And, and give her your bathing cap. Have the sandals as well. There. Indistinguishable from Francie Stevens. You know what to do. Yes. If anyone calls to you, wave and keep going. Don't hide your face and don't hurry. I understand. Then get the jewelry and this note to Bellini fast as you can. Suppose she doesn't feel like giving up the jewelry. She can't have Paul and the jewelry, and I think she'd rather have Paul. Wouldn't you, Denya? Yes. <laughs> Make him a good wife, Denya. He deserves it. I'll do my best. Hold on, has Paul proposed to you? Oh, yeah, in Cannes, at the beach, a few times. Really? Well, I said no, but I can change my mind. Some girls have all the luck. Go, Danielle. Now! The terrace wasn't visible from the window, but in a few minutes we saw Paul's car going down the narrow winding road. Is anyone following them? No, they've made it. So what happens next? I've suggested that Bellini should negotiate some arrangement with Mr. Page for the return of the jewelry. A reward was offered, and he did ask Bellini to make inquiries. And that's all? I can't think of anything else. Oh, going back to my room. I went back to Mr. Burns' room and resumed my disguise, struggling back into the padding, touching up my hair with a dye. I stayed there for some time, then headed for the pool, thinking I might see Francie. But on the way, one of the staff told me that she and her mother had already left and gone back to Cannes. Then I saw Bellini and Mr. Page talking with one of the policemen. Bellini waved me over to join them. Ah, the Inspector. Have you met Mr. Burns from New York? How do you do, sir? Monsieur? Mr. Page and I were just about to explain to the Inspector that we had arranged to have an agent from the insurance company working on the case as an inside man, and you are that man. I work on an entirely confidential basis, Inspector, taking no credit. Ah, and Inspector, now that all the stolen jewelry has been returned undamaged, Mr. Page was about to remind you of the guarantee that we gave in our advertisements for its safe return. We promised that no questions would be asked. Quite, quite. Hmm. The reward has been paid. And salted away by Bellini and his associates. And I am reliably informed by my contacts that the thief has left the country on an assisted passage. Ah, uh, je comprends. The inspector looked none too happy, but there was nothing he could do. Bellini gave me a lift into Cannes and dropped me off at the Hotel Midi. I went straight to Francie's room. Come in. Francie, you're packing. Why are you packing? I'm flying back to the States this evening. Why would you do that? It's my home. And there's nothing to keep me here, is there? I don't want you to leave. To leave Can, or to leave you? Me. I don't want you to leave me. And is this Mr. Burns speaking, or Mr. Roby? John Roby. I don't want you to leave me. Ever. <laughs> At last. <laughs> I put my arms around her. John? Yes? When are you going to take off that ridiculous disguise? 